Cool. Hello, I'm Rob. I work for Evertech. Um, you can find me on Twitter at RobRamseyNZ. And today I'm going to talk about frameworks. What the hell are they? Of course, Rails is a framework, and I'm just going to try and explain essentially what that is, and also talk a little bit about how code loading works with the movie, because you really need to understand that to get a sense of how um, Rails works as a framework. Cool, but before we do that, I think it's kind of easy to think about a framework as what they're not. And a framework is not a content management system. Um, probably most people here will be familiar with CMSs, things like WordPress. This is what uh, Wikipedia has to say about it. But for me, what a uh, CMS really is, is a configuration system. It's something where um, you set it up and you do your work using configuration rather than writing your own code for it. Um, they're generally optimized for simple content, things like pictures, videos, or um, text. And the structure is really kind of set in stone. It's something where um, you can't play you know, loose with um, the framework itself. This is kind of uh, as opposed to a web application framework, which Ruby is. Again, this is what Wikipedia has to say about it. But for me, this is really just helper code. And the important thing about um, like a framework is that it's a collection of lots and lots of little helper functions which you're using to accomplish your work. So rather than by just configuring systems, you're writing code and you're patching things together. So in this case, the structure is kind of suggested rather than dictated. Um, and you can kind of replace or circumvent bits, although generally that's a bad idea, but the option is there. And it's kind of one of the important differences to um, a content management system. Cool. So how does this actually work in Ruby on Rails? Um, you might have heard people say that Rails is a model view controller system or an MVC framework. What that really means is that um, Rails is a collection of helper modules or functions which are implementing this kind of philosophy of a model view controller application. So rather than it being something you configure, you pull in the different components and then you make this um, make an application out of the different components using your own code to configure it. So the first part of this is the controller, which um, in Rails is action control. And what that does is it makes decisions um, based on a request that's come in from the internet. So if someone wants to get a particular page, the controller will get this first, and the controller will decide how it's going to handle that. You know, is the user logged in? Are they an admin? Things like that. The next part of um, the Rails framework is the model, uh, which in our case is Active Record, and this model will um, control access to the database. It has lots of helpful functions for dealing with data. And um, the last part of MVC is the view, and that will basically um, use the information that it's received in order to construct the page, and it sends that back out to um, the person on the internet who's arrested something, or the robot. Um, there's another part to the system which is not MVC, but I think it's also really important called routing. And um, what routing is doing is it's um, essentially controlling the flow of traffic around the system, so it will decide which parts of the system get which requests. Um, there's actually a lot more stuff within Ruby on Rails, but these four components are the bits that you'll really be interacting with if you build Rails apps. So that's all cool, but you know, where does all of this Ruby code come from? Essentially, we're pulling in components to build our app. Um, but these are kind of magically loaded from nowhere. If you've ever programmed Rails, you'll hear the phrase magic quite a bit. So what I'm going to try and do in the next section is just try and talk a little bit about how code is loaded within Ruby, and um, try and give you a sense of how Rails is actually constructing its components underneath. Um, so the way Ruby loads code is using um, these load and require statements. And what that does is it essentially goes to a file on the file system, and it reads that file, and it understands the file. It's what we call parsing. Um, so an example of this is um, if I have a file called RubyTimes, um, that's declaring a variable in there. 
I can then load that uh, file and I suddenly have access to the variable that's kind of been understood and now my environment actually understands what was within the file. Um, to see an example of this within, um, sorry, I'll go on to loading system code. So there's another um, important point about this where you can load um, system code which is hidden in the background. So in this case here, um, I'm working with a CSV file. And in order to do that, I'm going to pull in this um, CSV Ruby um, file using the require directive. And that gives me a nice CSV variable, which lets me do handy things, like looping over the rows in the CSV and um, getting them in a format that I want. Uh, the important thing to kind of realize about uh, this system loading is that this csv.rb is actually kind of hidden in the background. It's in a location that you generally wouldn't see. But because it's in the right location, Ruby knows how to find it. So anywhere on your system, on the standard Ruby install, you can go in and just go require csv and with one line, get access to something which is hidden quite far away. So um, the idea that where something is located um, is a really handy thing to uh, realize. Cool. Um, the next part of the picture is inheriting code. And um, Ruby is uh, implements something called object-oriented program. This is used really, really heavily within Rails. Most of what you do within Rails will be object-oriented. Um, and essentially, it's based around the idea of um, subclasses inheriting code from their parent classes. Um, a good example is Volvo being a subclass of Tana. So if you stuck code on the car model, you can get to it within the Volvo model. It's a nice way of sharing um, code. Uh, a simple example here, we have a cat class, <coughs> which knows how to talk. And I've declared another class called Kelly. This class is inheriting from cat class. That little uh, less than arrow is basically saying inherit from cat. And now that I've inherited from cat, when I create a Kelly, um, that Kelly can speak using words that came from the cat. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> within uh, Rails, a really typical example of where you'll see this sort of code sharing is um, within Active Record, the models part of the MVC. Uh, by inheriting So with kind of one little line, I've pulled in a whole lot of information which has been sucked out of a file hidden in the background somewhere. Um, that's really cool, but sometimes that breaks down because you can only ever inherit from one class, which kind of becomes a bit of a doozy. Um, so there are a lot of instances where you will want to take in, within a single class, you want to get a lot of different um, sections of code from different places. And you do that by including and extending. Um, which I'll show you here. Uh, so there's the include and the extend keywords within Ruby. And essentially what these do is they pull in uh, code from elsewhere and they include it within your class. Include and extend actually do very similar things, but they work very differently. I'm not going to go into this. There's actually a bit of complexity around here. But really the important thing is this idea of sucking in code from somewhere else, including it. So a simple example here is I'm going to create a line duck. And we have a lion module, which knows how to roar, and a duck, which has a funny walk. I am going to use the include methods to pull these um, different code from the two different modules into the Kali class. And when I create a Kali, it can both roar and walk. <laughs> if this was a class, I wouldn't have been able to do that because the class can only inherit from one thing. So I would have to explicitly create a line up rather than pulling from both. Cool. Within Rails, you probably won't run into extending or encoding very often. Um, it's used very heavily internally. If you're creating a large code base and you need to organize your code, people tend to be very disciplined in doing this. They use these systems for essentially modularizing your code and organizing it very strongly. So it's used really, really heavily within Rails. But as someone who writes Rails apps, you probably won't see it too often. Um, the one place you might run into it is if you're using external libraries. Um, we call them gems. Uh, sometimes these will install themselves into your application by using the include or extend 
One of the examples that I've seen is uh, Pundit, which is a security gem. And this um, is providing an authorized method which you can see down there. So by including it within our controller, then within the controllers of the system, we can use methods which were included within the Pundit uh, module. <coughs> Cool, so now that we've kind of gone through this long journey explaining how you um, include and extend and load files and do all this magic, um, it kind of makes frameworks make a little bit more sense, I think. So we can have a file which can load other files if it needs to, so it knows what it needs to include. It will load or acquire them. It will then inherit or mix in um, the code that it needs. I Sorry, digress. Mix in was including or extending. Often we'll call that mixing in, but with your kind of mixing in code from somewhere else into your class. And once you understand how that works, you can think of a framework as like um, a system that will load your custom code and will then combine it with its own components and then runs it as one single thing to create a single web app using code from different places. Cool, thank you.